Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, in our three-day symposium on remembering the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. I'm Dr. Carlos Hill. I'm Associate Professor and Chair of the Claire Luper Department of African and African American Studies at the University of Oklahoma. And on behalf of the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Coordinating Committee, co-chairs Dr. Kalinda Eaton and Dr. Daniel Simon, welcome. Uh, this afternoon's lecture is pre-recorded and it'll run about 40 minutes. Scott Ellsworth, who is um, featured in the presentation, he will join us after the pre-recorded portion for a live Q&A and I will moderate that Q&A. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Scott, who I consider um, uh, the premier historian of the race massacre. He's also a dear friend of mine who I'm in conversation with constant, con constantly about this history amongst other things. And today, Dr. Ellsworth is going to share with us um, his work on the race massacre that has stretched some um, more than 40 years. And so today's talk um, is entitled Uncovering a Tragedy, the Tulsa Race Massacre. Before we start the pre-recording, I just want to give our participants just a little bit more background information um, on Dr. Ellsworth. And so Dr. Ellsworth is a native of Tulsa. Um, you know, he would say he's born and bred in Tulsa. Um, so he's a native Tulsan, he's an author, he's a professor of African and African American studies at the University of Michigan. Dr. Ellsworth's Death in a Promised Land was the first scholarly account um, of the race massacre. And that book has had a long life since it was published in 1982. Uh, it is still featured and cited, uh, whether it's in the media or in academic uh, scholarship. And so Dr. Ellsworth, um, as a kind of uh, follow-up, if you will, to his death in the promised land and has produced uh, his forthcoming book, uh, The Groundbreaking, uh, that'll be out in, um, in, in May. Uh, but The Groundbreaking tells the story of Tulsa and Greenwood since the race massacre and particularly the ways in which the massacre continues to re reverberate um, in the community as well as within, this, within the state of Oklahoma. And so we have a real treat um, in store for you today to hear uh, Dr. Ellsworth talk about um, the, the, the history and the legacies, as well as some of the work that he is doing in the, in, in the Greenwood district around mass graves. And so without further ado, uh, we will begin the pre-recorded portion of the presentation. And then in the, again, and, and after that, we will uh, have a live Q&A with Dr. Ellsworth. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming today. Uh, I can tell you that I really wish I was back home uh, in Oklahoma with you all. Um, that didn't turn out to be the case when Daniel Simon and Carlos Hill started to plan this. Um, we just didn't know when I was going to get vaccinated, and uh, we came awfully close. I just got my second vaccine shot on Saturday, uh, so we were about a week from having me there, but uh, thanks so much for coming anyway. Um, I want to start by taking us to the summer of 1975. Um, uh, Saigon had fallen earlier that spring. The Vietnam War, more or less, was finally ended. Uh, Gerald Ford was the president of the United States. Uh, disco was just starting. A uh, then unknown New Jersey rocker named Bruce Springsteen was about to have his first big hit. Um, I was 21 years old. I was a, a, a between my junior and senior year at Reed College out in Portland, Oregon. But I'd come home to Tulsa to research my senior thesis about the, what we then called the Tulsa Race Riot of 1921. Um, I had grown up in Tulsa, and I had heard stories about the massacre uh, when I was a child, about uh, bodies floating down the Arkansas River, airplanes, uh, machine guns on the roofs of buildings. But 
but it was something you really just couldn't find out anything about. And by the time I went off to college, I knew very little, but I became a history major and was interested in American history. And when I needed to, to pick a thesis topic, I thought I would do the race ride. And um, so I came back home. My, my parents had retired to California. So I needed to get an apartment and to get a job to pay for that apartment so I could you know, do research on the riot. And um, so I ended up taking a job working in a, in a steel factory, working from um, 5.30 at night to four in the morning, which paid the rent, bought my groceries, but also gave me some time during the day to research. So, you know, uh, Monday through Friday, I'd get up mid morning, put on my one pair of JC Penny slacks and a couple dress shirts and go off to archives and library and city light, you know, city offices and try to research uh, the riot, what we call the riot. And the, the, the truth of the matter is I just couldn't get anywhere for weeks. Um, records were missing, things weren't available. I, you know, I had a lot of sort of city clerks kind of, well, we ain't got anything like that. Or, you know, I have to check with my manager. We don't know anything about that. People kind of, you know, blowing off this, you know, 21 year old. Um, and it was also very difficult at that time to find any photographs whatsoever of the massacre. Everyone today, if you haven't looked at it, make sure you go and look at Carlos Hill's just spectacular photographic history of the massacre. But, you know, in 1975, it was far to find any photos at all. So, um, you know, but during the course of this early study, I did run across a photo I'd never seen before in a national magazine, and it was a panoramic of Greenwood after, after the riot. And I was just stunned by it. Uh, you know, it looked like Hiroshima or Nagasaki or, you know, Berlin or Frankfurt during, after they'd been bombed in World War II. And my problem was I just couldn't figure out how this seemingly small incident in an elevator in downtown Tulsa had led to this racial holocaust. And uh, sometime around July, I caught a break. I ran into a woman who was a friend of my mother's best friend. Her name was Ruth Avery. Um, Ruth Avery had been about eight or 10 at the time of the riot. And uh, she had watched as a flatbed truck loaded with uh, the corpses of riot victims had passed by her home on the north side. And that had made a huge impression on her. And later on as an adult, she was determined to research the history of the riot, try to save it. And she was great. I mean, she was very supportive of what I was doing. And she asked me how I was doing. I said, Ruth, it's just not going very well. I can't figure out the dynamics of this thing, how it got going. And she said, oh, you ought to go see Mr. Williams. And I said, well, who's Mr. Williams? And she explained that uh, W.D. Williams was a uh, retired teacher at Booker T. Washington High School, that he had grown up in Tulsa, was alive at the time of the riot, and that he apparently knew a lot about it. And she gave me a hint as to where he lived. And so I looked him up in the phone book and found W.D. Williams on uh, North Denver Avenue. And I gave him a call and told him who I was and asked him if I could, that I could come over and talk to him. And, uh, you know, and this was the first oral history interview I had ever done in my life. And oral history at that time was a little bit controversial. A lot of, you know, scholars weren't so sure whether it was legitimate or not. So I drive over to his home, a very nice, uh, neat brick home uh, uh, on North Denver uh, Boulevard uh, with very distinctive aluminum awnings on it, nicely mowed grass and all that. And it was, it was in a neighborhood, it was along Reservoir Hill. And Reservoir Hill had been, uh, you know, in the, ter the early days of Tulsa after it boomed as an oil capital, there had been some great mansions on Reservoir Hill. It was a really prime real estate. But as the city has expanded, you know, the, the wealthiest neighborhoods had moved to the South. And then uh, after the Brown decision, uh, I can tell you this, the Brown decision was passed in 1954. Um, uh, the school officials and politicians in Tulsa, the white politicians drugged their feet as long as they could. I did not have an African-American classmate until 1969. But, you know, once the Brown decision had passed, there was a lot of white flight off of Reservoir Hill. And uh, as those families fled and went to the South, and African-Americans purchased those homes, which was a 
not only a great deal for them, but also there was a lack of, of, of housing in Greenwood, the black community at the time. So uh, here is Mr. Williams living this home. But the fact of the matter is, is, is W.D. Williams, William Danforth Williams was actually, he was Greenwood royalty. He was 70, 70 years old at the time. Um, but his parents, John and Lula Williams had been amongst the most successful entrepreneurs in, in Greenwood before the massacre. They, uh, they owned the Green, they, they owned the Dreamland Theater. They built and owned the Dreamland Theater right on Greenwood Avenue which uh, seated over 700 people. It showed movies, it had vaudeville, musical acts, uh, lectures, conventions, um, boxing matches as well too. Uh, they also owned the East End Garage. They were the first family, African-American family, as far as we know, to own an automobile in Tulsa. Uh, John Williams was also a great mechanic. He created a, a garage. He had served, he had worked as a chauffeur for some Rich Tulsa oil man and parlayed that into uh, an automobile fixing business and, and parlayed that into this garage. They also owned a three-story brick building on the southwest corner of Greenwood and Archer, the Williams building. On the first floor, there was a, a confectionery that Lula ran, you know, which sold candy and ice cream. On the second floor, they rented that out uh, as office space to African-American uh, physicians, dentists, lawyers, and on the third floor, the family had their own apartment. So, um, you know, this was, you know, a, a, an amazing family. And WD had grown up right there in the heart of the deep Greenwood, the Greenwood Commercial District. He knew everyone in the stores. He knew everything else. He, he saw how the community came alive, especially on Thursday when African-American maids who worked in well-to-do white homes on the south side, had a day off and would come and shop. And that was a part of his life. Uh, in 1921, he was 16 years old. He was a student at, at Booker T. Washington and, and he knew this Greenwood community. But he also watched it die as well and get destroyed. Um, he, he was everywhere at the right place at the right time, practically. Um, W.D. Williams had read the May 1931 uh, edition, Bulldog edition of the Tulsa Tribune. He had seen the front page article that, you know, claims that Dick Rowland tried to sexually assault Sarah Page, this white elevator operator. Um, but he had also read the now fam infamous and lost editorial to Lynch a Negro Tonight. Um, he had seen a, a black uh, a veteran uh, jump up on the stage of the Dreamland Theater late that afternoon, early that evening and say, shut this place down. We ain't gonna let this happen here. We're not gonna have a lynching here. He had watched as African-American men and women had gathered on Greenwood Avenue in that first block uh, in front of the offices of the Tulsa Star and other places and discussing what to do in response to this white lynch mob that had gathered downtown who were going to lynch Dick Rowland. And he had watched as, as 75 African-American men armed with rifles, pistols, and shotguns, mainly World War I vets, you know, with their uniforms had driven off to go downtown to prevent the lynching. And all that long, terrible night of May 31st, June 1st, he had been in the third floor family apartment and helped to reload his father's uh, 30 30 rifle and repeating shotgun as his dad fought to keep these white rioters from invading Greenwood. And then in the next morning, he'd watched the white mobs, white mob, you know, numbering in the thousands as they crossed the railroad tracks towards Greenwood to burn, loot, and and destroy the community. Uh, and uh, he got away, you know, safely, and and went on to have, you know, getting married. He uh, had a very long career as a, as a teacher at Booker T. Washington, and he was also one of the people who tried to keep the story alive. He would. He would tell his students at Booker T, you know, about the massacre. But as the decades went on, people knew less about it. In the late 1950s, he told a class about the massacre and the students didn't believe him. They didn't believe that this had happened at all. So, you know, in, in truth, W.D. Williams had been waiting his entire life to tell this story, to tell what had happened, to tell of the destruction of more than 1,000 African-American businesses as homes that were looted and burned by white mobs with 
the help of the white police and the National Guard on June 1st, 1921, to talk about the unknown numbers of deaths, to talk about all of this horrible, uh, you know, event that happened. You know, he had been waiting for a journalist, uh, you know, a reporter for a ma national magazine or a newspaper, a, a television news crew to come to his house, been waiting for a professor, a college professor, to come and ask him, you know, what had happened, but, but none came. And he sure as hell wasn't waiting for me on that August day in 1975. Here I was, a 20, not only was I a, a college student, I didn't have a tape recorder or a camera. I was not experienced at this at all. And I was just a nobody student. And even worse, I was a white student who had grown up in those same neighborhoods where those murderers had, had also come from on that day in 1921 to kill him and his family and to destroy all their businesses. Um, I can tell you that conversation changed my life. Um, uh, it, um, you know, I would not have written Death in a Promised Land, you know, my first book on the massacre, had it not been for that discussion that day with W.D. Williams. Uh, I would not be talking to you today if not had been for that discussion. But I, you know, but I don't want to talk about that or the impact on me. What I, what I want to share with you are some thoughts about the barriers that people like W.D. Williams and others faced in Tulsa, black and white, and trying to get the story of the massacre out, you know, and also and also to honor them because they are really the unsung heroes of everything that's going on right now. They're the ones who kept the story alive, made sure that people hear, heard, heard about it, and they were the ones who saw things and remembered certain things or helped to uncover things over the years to bring us this story. And, uh, you know, and, and I think it's important to remember, you know, and, and just to emphasize that, that in white Tulsa, the story of the massacre was actively suppressed for more than 50 years, actively suppressed. People say, well, why haven't I heard about this? Well, this is a reason why. Um, the city fathers of Tulsa, the, uh, the mayor, the Chamber of Commerce types and, and everyone else, when the riot happens, it's front page, and I'll use riot massacre interchangeably. Um, uh, when the massacre happened, this was front page news all over the country, front page in the New York Times, Los Angeles, front, it was in the Times of London, it was even in the Times of India. This was a big, huge story. And why Tulsa City's fathers realized that they had a big PR problem, you know, the black community destroyed, train service interrupted, is martial law declared, all of that. And um, they decided early on to take a, a, a tact in dealing with it. The first was that they told the world that white Tulsans were very sorry about what would happen and that they would build, rebuild the black community. Um, and they didn't, they lied. Uh, they instead tried to steal the land where the African-American commercial district had been. Uh, and their relief efforts were minimal, you know, pitiful at best. Uh, meanwhile, as the years went on, you know, official records, National Guard reports, things like that began to disappear. There was an alleged uh, uh, list of riot fatalities that uh, had existed in the Tulsa Police Department as late as the 1960s. It disappeared as well, too. Um, you know, at first there were people very proud of it, and there were some people who took part in white riders who were proud of this till the day they died. But um, for a while there were photographs sold of the destruction of Greenwood or of the corpses of African-American riot victims as, as postcards, but they eventually go away as well too. And, uh, you know, people realize this isn't something to talk about. And this sort of curtain of silence starts to descend on the city. And it's amazing what it was. Um, Tulsa's white and daily newspapers, the World and the Tribune, for decades do not talk, write about the race riot, the race massacre. They just, after the 20s, they just drop the subject like a lead balloon. And in fact, the afternoon paper, the Tribune went to just great lengths not to talk about it. The, uh, the Tribune in the 1930s, 1940s, on the opposite of their editorial page, they had a column, you know, what happened in Tulsa 10 years ago today, or 15 years ago, or 20 years ago today. And, uh, uh, you know, in 1936, it was what happened in Tulsa 15 years ago today. 
So when they're getting, when they get to the day that is the 15th anniversary of the riot, you know, what are they going to write about? I mean, there were just so many stories of the riot that they could discuss, martial law being declared, state troops going in, on and on and on, and stuff like that. Instead, this is an example of what the Tribune wrote 15 years ago from the Tribune, June 1st, 1921. Miss Carolyn Skelly was a charming young hostess of the past week, having entertained at a luncheon and theater party for Miss Kathleen Sinclair and her guest, Miss Julia Morley of Saginaw, Michigan. Corsage bouquets of Cecil roses and sweet peas were presented to the guests, who were Mrs. Claudine Miller, Martha Sharp, Elizabeth Cook, Jane Robinson, Pauline Wood, Marie Constantin, Irene Buell, on and on and on. Other things like this. Miss Vera Gwynn will leave next week for Chicago to enter the University of Chicago, where she will take a course in kindergarten study. So rather than write about the riot, they instead gave the social news of, of Tulsa's elite. Um, and what happens is, you know, middle class families get warned. This the, the riot is something you're not supposed to talk about. There was a there was a, a, a kid I grew up in Tulsa in the 1960s in my all white middle class neighborhood. And uh, his parents later told me, the mother later told me that she and her husband had moved to Tulsa from a small town in Kansas. And they had known about the massacre. And but when they moved to Tulsa in the 1950s, they're at a party with neighbors and they bring it up. And, and she said it was just this hush came over the room. And then someone just told her, we don't talk about that in around here. And what happened is the riot isn't discussed decade after decade, the memory of it starts to slip away. But what also happened was that as some people started to investigate the riot, they start to run into a whole new different set of problems that simply go beyond missing records. And one of them who did was a woman by the name of Nancy Feldman. Nancy Feldman uh, grew up on the North Shore of Chicago in a very well-to-do Jewish family. The family had a mansion, you know, a couple blocks from Lake Michigan. They had their own live-in, you know, chauffeur. Um, even during the Great Depression, Nancy's uh, mother would order dresses for her from New York City because the, you know, the Marshall Fields or whatnot was not classy enough for the Feldman family. So she grows up in this very, you know, wealthy and uh, protected environment. But around the time in high school or late junior high, she she doesn't want to be part of the Bobby Soxer set and chase boys and stuff. And and she gets very deeply into athletics, into swimming. And she soon soon becomes a, a national caliber swimmer and diver. And she's got her heart set on being in the next Olympic Games, representing the United States in the swim team. But then around the time of her senior year in high school, she has a horrible accident. She breaks her back, I believe, and her swimming career is over. So what she decides to do then is to throw herself into her studies. Um, you know, she graduates from Northwestern in three years. She then is one of just a handful, two or three female students to go to law school at the University of Chicago. She graduates with a law degree. She meets this young man who's from Tulsa. They get married. Uh, and in 1946, the Feldmans, as newlyweds, moved to this brand new town of Tulsa. And her husband, who's also a lawyer, gets a job immediately, but it's impossible for Nancy as a woman lawyer to get hired in town. She just can't get hired anywhere. She would occasionally get an interview at a law firm. And the first question they asked was, how fast can you type? And so she finally gives up on a law career. And then she decides she's going to, you know, she ends up teaching at the University of Tulsa. And the University of Tulsa at that time is a, a small, very much a local college. All the kids, it's all white. All the kids are from Tulsa. They've all grown up in Tulsa. It's not the, you know, the fine university that it is today. And um, so Nancy becomes a social teacher. She's very interested in sociology and race relations and things like that. And through her interest in recreation, this is around 1948, she meets uh, the one African-American recreation employee of the city of Tulsa, a man by the name of Robert Fairchild. And Robert Fairchild, African-American, college graduate, master's degree. Um, he a former athlete as well. 
um, Nancy and, and Fairchild hit it off and become friends. And then one day Fairchild tells her about the race ride and he had survived the ride. He and his brothers had lived through it, what had happened. And, and Feldman had never heard of it. And she was just blown away by what she heard. And because um, she had heard of the Chicago race ride of 1919, but not what had happened in Tulsa. And uh, she goes to her in-laws who are from Tulsa and said, did this happen? And they say, yes, it did. And she's just blown away by it. So the next day in class, she's got this group of undergraduates and she starts talking about the race ride. And they all say, what are you talking about? Nothing like that ever happened around here, no way. And she says, well, go and ask your parents. They'll tell you about it. And uh, they did. And then the next day in class, they reported back. Our parents said nothing like that ever happened. So Feldman can't believe it. So what she decides to do is to invite Robert Fairchild this African-American ride survivor, to come and speak to her class at TU. And in 1948, that's pretty dicey on the color line in Oklahoma. There were, of course, no black students at TU, anything like that. But, but Fairchild comes, he tells his students ex his experiences and blows them away. But that's not the end of the story, because shortly after that, um, Feldman was summoned to her dean's office and her dean tells her that if she ever did that again, she would get fired. Um, I spoke with uh, Nancy Feldman years later, and also she later said, but that wasn't the worst of it. Remember, my students were all white Tulsa kids. They had all grown up here. Yet before I bought, brought Bob Fairchild into class, not a single one had ever heard about the riot. In less than 30 years, it had been erased from the collective memory. It was as if it had never happened at all. Now, we don't know how many other Nancy Feldmans there were, other people who wanted to investigate the riot, write about it, but were scared off, pushed away for some reason. Uh, we know that there was a, a young army veteran by the name of Lauren Gill, who wrote a master's thesis at TU about the riot, very important thesis. We don't know what happened to him. Uh, he seemed to avoid that. But the threats did not go away. And in fact, they were still around as late as 1970 and 1971, when a gentleman by the name, a white gentleman by the name of uh, Ed Wheeler decided he wanted to write a newspaper article about the riot. Now, Ed Wheeler, I can tell you, was as straight an arrow as one can imagine. He, uh, um, he was a, a businessman, successful businessman. He had uh, he had stumped for the Republican Party back when Oklahoma was still Democratic, you know, and so he starts to investigate. He's, his plan is to write a story about the riot for its 50th anniversary that he would then publish in the Tulsa World of the T Tribune. But as he's starting to do research, things start happening. He gets uh, approached on the streets of Tulsa by three, two strange men he's never seen before who tell him, you better not write that article. Don't you dare write that article. Uh, and then uh, at all hours of the night, phone calls start coming in to his home saying that, um, you know, um, don't you dare write that. Uh, the, the anonymous callers threatened uh, not only Wheeler, but his wife and his infant son. Uh, one day he goes out onto his front step and there's a dead chicken on his doorstep. This is in, you know, the Brookside neighborhood in Tulsa. And uh, then one morning he goes out and there's a note on the front windshield of his car that says best check under the hood next time, meaning we're gonna put a bomb under your car if you write this article. Well, Wheeler went ahead and wrote the article, but neither the Tulsa World or the Tribune would publish it, you know, and, uh, you know, and this curtain of silence is still holding. Now, um, there's an irony though, which is the irony was that during the same period, the, the massacre isn't talked about publicly and openly in the African-American community in Tulsa, in Greenwood as well. And, uh, you know, the Oklahoma Eagle, which had for decades been uh, the flagship newspaper, black newspaper in Tulsa, it wouldn't write about it. On these anniversaries in, you know, 1941 and 1951 and 1961, there was nothing. Uh, in 1946, on the 25th anniversary of the riot, there was one sentence about the riot in the Oklahoma Eagle and it, it was in an editorial about the Klan, and it said, and in 1921, one of the worst race riots in American history happened. It didn't even say in Tulsa. And um, 
And so what do we make of this? Why? And, and I think the thing to remember is just what a catastrophic event this was. You know, we don't know how many people died. We know this community is, you know, absolutely burned to the ground. And uh, a lot of people suffered from PTSD. I'd interview ride survivors in the 1990s who still had PTSD. Um, I interviewed, a, a, a got to know a, a survivor quite well by the name of Kenny Booker in 19. 99, um, uh, I was asked, uh, I helped to arrange for his portrait to be taken by a, a photographer for the New York Times. And when it came closer and closer for the story to be published in the Times by Brent Staples, which also included the, the, the photograph of Kenny Booker, Kenny got quite worried and told me that he was worried that if, his, if the photograph appeared that he might get attacked, that, um, that his family might get attacked, there was at least one survivor I knew of who as late as the 1970s still kept a loaded rifle by his front door in, you know, quote, in case it should happen again, unquote. You know, and, but I think one way to think about the massacre is to also to think about Holocaust survivors and how oftentimes Holocaust survivors did not want to talk to their children or grandchildren about these horrible experiences they had gone through and to, and to burden them with these traumas anew. Uh, Brenda Alford, uh, who was recently the chair of the Public Oversight Committee, uh, working with us on our investigation into the mass graves, um, she didn't, even though her grandparents um, were, um, had lost their homes and businesses during the, during the massacre, she didn't hear about it until she was an adult in the 1980s. Uh, Brenda later said, Many survivors of the massacre did not talk about the attack afterwards. For some, it was too traumatizing. Others remained mum about the massacre because they saw their silence as a way of protecting their future generations from experiencing what they had lived through. And still, many were forced into silence by bad actors who threatened their jobs or even their lives. So the reality is, is that the curtain held well into the 70s, this curtain of silence or into the 60s. But in the end, the curtain was going to be no match for a fellow by the name of Don Ross. Now, Don Ross, African-American, uh, uh, you know, born and raised in Greenwood, uh, uh, spent a little time in, in Veneta growing up, but back in Greenwood by high school, student at Booker T. Washington High School. Um, Don Ross wasn't the worst student at Booker T in the late 1950s, but he was probably in the running. Uh, he didn't like to read books. He'd only read comic books. Uh, he had only a, a vague grasp of comprehension or comprehension of punctuation, according to some of his teachers. He would pick his classes on the basis of who, which classes had the best looking girls students in it. And he would always skip his six hour class to go shoot pool at the Big Ten pool hall. And, uh, but, you know, he ends up, you know, graduating barely from Booker T. He ends up be going to the Air Force, becomes the first African-American union baker in Oklahoma, returns to Tulsa, and eventually becomes a journalist. And he catches wind of the riot. And he, in 1968, he writes the first series of articles uh, in the Oklahoma Eagle about the massacre. This is the first series of articles about the massacre in a Tulsa newspaper since the 1920s. And he really breaks the taboo about talking about the riot in Greenwood. And then three years later in 1971, it's Don Ross who publishes um, uh, Ed Wheeler's article that none of the white newspapers would publish. And so eventually by the 1970s, there is this slow opening. And, and I'm a part of that too. You know, in 1982, my book, Death in a Promised Land, comes out. It's uh, ignored in a lot of, uh, you know, quarters in Tulsa. Um, it becomes the most stolen book out of the Tulsa City County Library for years. I mean, all even the co copies of the branches were taken. And so every year I would just buy them a box of books and send it to them. But it slowly starts to open the doors for people to talk about it. Um, you know, and, and projects happen. But it's, it's, it's not until the watershed moment in really starting the process to bring the story out, in, not just in Tulsa, but in the country and the world, uh, doesn't happen until 1995. And that is with the, the bombing of the uh, Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City bombing. 
And, uh, you know, we have to remember this is before 9-11, you know, this great tragic bombing, hundreds of people killed, all of that. This was gigantic news. And uh, uh, it was such big news that the Today Show, the morning show on NBC, and that's a very powerful show at that point, um, uh, flew its entire crew from New York City to broadcast live from Oklahoma City. And the other morning shows did as well. And during that week, um, and, and the host of the show was Bryant Gumbel, who was the first African-American host of a major network you know, television news program. And uh, during that week, Don Ross, remember Don Ross, the journalist, he's now an Oklahoma state legislator who's representing Greenwood in the state legislature. He's able to meet Brian Gumbel during that week. And he goes up to Mr. Gumbel and says, look, as horrible as this Oklahoma City bombing is, there's another story. It's even bigger. It's never been given any of the attention it needs. And uh, uh, Don Ross gave Brian Gumbel a copy of Death in a Promised Land. Uh, and then about 10 days later, uh, Don Ross and I both get calls from a producer at NBC saying on the 75th anniversary of the riot in 1996, the Today Show will do a story about the massacre. This was gigantic news. Um, with the exception of a uh, an op-ed that ran in 1982 in the Washington Post when my Death in the Promised Land came out, first came out, there had been no national news stories about the riot since the 1920s. So things start to pick up, A uh, uh, committees are formed, A Black Wall Street Memorial is going to be unveiled on the 75th anniversary. I'm interviewed for the piece. A uh, number of survivors are too. But as we got closer to the air date, I realized, well, shoot, if we got the Today Show, maybe I can leverage that and get us some other uh, news media to cover the, the, the massacre. And so uh, I got on the phone, and in a week, I got the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Associated Press, National Public Radio, all to agree to come to Tulsa and do stories. And so the 75th anniversary happens, we get a lot of attention. This is the first kind of national attention to the riot. And uh, we made the front page of the Washington Post, a three quarter page story in uh, the New York Times. There was a lot of attention, a lot of stories went out. And, and Don Ross was brilliant because he used all that attention to go to the, the Republican governor of the state and the Republican dominated state legislature and told them, look, we've, we've had this horrible Tulsa race riot. We've never had an official study on it. Let's create a commission to study it. And my sense is that the politicians said, well, we'll give this guy a little money. They can make their little report and we'll just not worry about him, ignore it. And, uh, but Don Ross was smart. Um, he knew how to count votes. And uh, as the commissioners were appointed, uh, he was able to make sure that enough commissioners who were going to vote in favor of reparations were appointed to the commission. So Ross's goal with this commission is to really to, to try to see if we can win reparations for massacre survivors. So the commission, you know, it takes off. Uh, I'll condense the history very quickly. Um, you know, at first the commission is ignored. It's ignored by everybody. The Tulsa newspapers and TV stations don't even pay attention to it. But I had launched with the permission of the commission and, and the encouragement of, of massacre survivors, the search for the, for the mass graves, these unmarked mass graves. Eventually that news story broke, you know, first in Tulsa, then nationally, then internationally. And all of a sudden we had a deluge of attention you know, mass graves was this key phrase. Everyone locked onto it. And, uh, you know, the 60 Minutes came and did a story on Tulsa. New York Times Magazine had a story. A journalist from Japan, Sweden, Switzerland flew to Oklahoma, flew to Tulsa to write stories about this. And ever since then, it's the attention to the story has really built, you know, all the way to today. You know, today, um, you can get on Google and you can type in Tulsa Race Massacre. And in, in less than a second, you'll get 1.5 million results. Um, there are scores of books about the massacre right now, children's books, serious stories, novels, you name it. There are there have been a number of documentaries. Many documentaries are still coming up. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, history, you know, 
elementary school and middle school and high school students all over the country doing National History Day competitions. Many of them have used the Tulsa Race Riot as their project. So the story has got out, it's growing bigger and bigger. And of course, when Watchmen, the Watchmen series came out, you know, it, that really brought the story all over the world. So the story is finally out. You know, we tend to talk about events like, well, something changed and then the story could come out. But the reality of, of, of the story of the Tulsa Race Massacre is that individual people buried it on purpose. A culture helped it stay buried, but it was also individual people who brought this story out. When people say, I don't understand why I've never heard of this. Well, W.D. Williams and Nancy Feldman and Don Ross and Ed Wheeler and others like them could tell you why. I wanna close just with a, with a couple of thoughts here very quickly. And uh, one of them is that, look, there's a lot we still don't know about the massacre, okay? Um, we still don't know how many people died. Anyone who tells you they know they're wrong I think reasonable, I've studied this for you know decades now. I think reasonable estimates go from 75 to as many as 300, but we don't know what that number is. It could be 75, it could be 300. We don't even know what the ratio of white to black casualties is. So, you know, there are other questions, very important historical questions that we still don't know the, the answers to, but we do know that it, we do know how the riot happened how it progressed, what happened. And, and I can't tell you how important W.D. Williams and other survivors, uh, many of whom I was lucky enough to interview in the 1970s. These were elderly African-American men and women who had been adults at the time of the massacre. And their stories are really why we know what happened. And you know, as a result of that, I think it's and a result of the threats that earlier researchers received when they're trying to do this, it's very important that we adhere to the facts and the truth. We need to be good stewards of this history. There was a lot, there's been a lot of exaggeration about the massacre. Um, exaggeration making it too small, exaggeration making it too big. And uh, we serve no one's interest by, by buying into that exaggeration. This is a hugely important event. This isn't a Tulsa event or an Oklahoma event. This is, the massacre was an event of national importance in the United States. This is something that we need to treat seriously and to do our best to understand its history and its fullness. So uh, facts matter. You know, the second thing, you know, I'm always reminded, you know, by the wonderful quote by William Faulkner, who said, you know, the, the past isn't dead, it's not even past. And that is certainly the case with the Tulsa Race Massacre today. While, you know, the shooting has long been over nearly 100 years. The fires, all of that are gone. The fact is we're still living with the reverberations of that and the injustices that were caused as a result of the massacre are still there today. They have not gone away and it is high time, I think, that we need to address them. Thank you very much. I'm honored to speak with you. I'm gonna sign off now and by magic, I will sign back on and uh, love to hear your questions. Thank you so much. Dr. Ellsworth, that- If you call me Dr. Ellsworth anymore, hey. I'm gonna start looking for my brother or my dad. So <laughs> you're gonna have to call me Scott Carlos because I'm not gonna call you Dr. Hill. Well, everybody doesn't know our, our very comfortable relationship. So I, 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 but I will call you Scott from, from thenceforth. Um, thank you for that. Um, I, every time you speak, even though I've heard you speak multiple times, even in the last few months, there's something new that I learn uh, from, from what you share. So, so thank you for that. Um, we have questions that will come in in the, right. in the, in the chat, and I'm going to share those with you as they come in. But I want to kick off our Q&A portion that'll go about 20 minutes just for everyone um, who's on the call, who's trying to figure out if, um, if they can stay for the whole time. Um, you, t you, you began, uh, or one of the initial comments you made was about the impact 
that the real conversation with WD had on you. Like you, you, you even said it, it transformed who you are. And I was just struck by that. And, and I know you don't wanna make this about you, but a lot of the work that I do with teachers is about their positionality and how we would like this history to impact them mm -hmm. and what they do in the classroom. And so could you just talk about um, just how this history, knowing this history, learning this history from W.D. Williams transformed you? Well, I, I'll, I'll just add, add just a brief story. So, um, you know, when I was trying, before I talked to him, when I was doing research, I just had so much difficulty finding anything about the massacre, about Greenwood beforehand. And then I discovered this wonderful things called city directories, and which were sort of like telephone books, these large books that would list the name of every head of household and every business and all the addresses for this city. And I realized that about every 10th listing, there was a little C in parentheses, a lowercase C. And I was trying to figure out what that was. I realized, oh, C meant colored. And this is a colored person or a co African American person, African American business. So then I went and to the city engineer's office, and I got these old plat maps of the commercial district because I wanted to understand what the business district looked like before it was born, before it was destroyed. And so I used the city directories and I filled in every single address, who lived there, what the business was, and all that. And that had a transformative effect on me because. What it did is now they weren't numbers. There were 12 churches destroyed or 30 railroads destroyed. No, it was, uh, you know, uh, Newkirk's photography studio, which was right next door to Hooker's Dry Goods Store, which was right next to Mabel Little's, you know, cafe were destroyed and the neighborhood became alive to me. So uh, to, uh, I want to carry on with the story. So when I go and see W.D. Williams, we're sitting at the uh, kitchen table in his house. And I'm trying to explain that I'm a student, all this. And he's kind of really stiff with me. Like, I'm thinking, this was a dumb idea. This guy doesn't have anything to tell me. You know, I'll just try to figure out a way to wrap up this interview. Oral history is a bad idea. We should just talk to established scholars and things like that. But then I remembered my maps and they're in my old day pack. And I pull them out and we spread them out on his kitchen table. And I'm sort of talking about how I made them. He's not listening at all. He's, he's hunched over these things and this big smile gets on his face and he goes over every single address. And what I realized was that, that I had made the, you know, I had created this map of his youth and some people he hadn't thought about for 50 years, 60 years. And it changed the whole dynamic. And then he just looks up at me and says, okay, so tell me what you want to know. And what it meant was that I'd made the grade with him. And then I tested him. I didn't know I did, but there had been a story in the New York Times that said right before the massacre, uh, handbills had appeared in Greenwood warning African-Americans to leave. And I thought, I read that. I thought, oh, that's it. The massacre was pre-planned. White folks had been trying to get this land. This is what it was. So I asked him about the handbills and he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, what handbills? There weren't any handbills. And then, and I determined later on that the handbill story was actually from a different town in Oklahoma at the edit, you know, at the New York Times headquarters, they'd conflated the two stories, but he made the grade with me at that point. And I realized here was somebody who was serious. He would not, you know, nothing was going to be exaggerated, that this history was important. And, and that, you know, that sold me right there. Three years later, he introduces me to other African American survivors, and it's really those stories. And you know, history, um, the history of, of uh, much of African American history, much of uh, the history of poor people in this country. This isn't written down and collected in archives. This is in people's heads, and you need to talk to the people who were there. And I was just very fortunate to have been there in that twilight of that adult generation who experienced the massacre and, and was lucky enough to get to meet and interview them. You know, I am completely jealous of you, uh, Scott, uh, having been in, you know, had the acquaintance of W.D. Williams and, and, and survivors, descendants. Um, and so, but, but what I hear you saying is in, in, in a lot of ways, 
when you began the project, you were trying to discover the history, but in your interactions with WD, your work really became in service of, of, of the survivors, trying to tell- oh, it did. You know, I, yeah. look, it, it didn't have to be me. It could have been somebody else if it wasn't me. It just happened to be. But, but you know, these I've actually talked to people who were never interviewed by anyone. And they certainly never told this story outside their family if they even told it within their family. And, uh, you know, I became their witness. And, you know, and again, this is not a pat on my back at all, but um, the reality is, is their work informs everything that you, me, everyone else knows about this event. And, uh, you know, I, and, and I wanna honor them, you know, and always give honor to them. You know, they weren't my co-authors of Death in a Promised Land, but in a way they were. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for that, that thoughtful reflection. We have a couple questions that have come in from the chat. Right. And one of them is related to the lost editorial that you mentioned. And another one is related to um, the economic uh, history of Greenwood. And so there's a lot of questions around what does it, what does it mean? What does Black Wall Street mean? What is, you know, what was the true wealth of this community? Um, what's the average wealth of a black person in Greenwood? How many black millionaires were there in Greenwood? Can you give, um, you know, some context to this, you know, black, this idea that Greenwood is as Black Wall Street, and then talk a little bit more about the lost editorial you mentioned? Sure, well, let's start, you know, as best I can with the economic angle. Look, it, it was not known as Black <clears throat> Wall Street in the 1920s or the 1930s or the 1940s. Um, Mary, Parrish, who was a uh, African-American journalist from Mississippi originally, who uh, moved to Tulsa from uh, New York State. Um, uh, she comes to Tulsa. She runs a secretarial school on Greenwood for young African-American uh, women. Uh, and she survives the massacre. And she writes this very, very important book called Events of the Tulsa Disaster. And a lot of testimony from massacre victims uh, economic data and whatnot. There is, we don't know how many copies were, were, were produced. There's some thought that there were less than 100. So this is a very precious book. One sold, uh, an original sold at auction last year for over $2,000. So this is a very rare book. But in, in her description of, of, the, of the, the Greenwood commercial district was known as Deep Greenwood. And in her dis description of it, she referred to it as the Negro's Wall Street. You know, again, she was a New Yorker who'd come here. And she doesn't mean that there were, you know, banks and stock brokerages and things like that, because there were no banks in, in Greenwood before the massacre. What she meant is this is a place where money changed hands and whatnot. So that term then gets uh, reintroduced. Um, certainly Don Ross had seen it in 1968 when he writes his uh, stories about the massacre for the Oklahoma Eagle. But the, the term Black Wall Street really doesn't become in common use until the 1990s. And particularly with the establishment on the 75th anniversary of the massacre with the Black Wall Street Memorial. And it's at that point that it goes on. Okay, so what's the community like? So we know that there's a, around 10 to 11,000 people who live in Greenwood. Um, you know, there's very, very high employment because there's so much money in Tulsa. And the vast majority of employed African-Americans in Tulsa, they work in the white community at often menial jobs as domestics, as servants, as cooks, as dishwashers, as janitors and ditch, and ditch diggers. African-Americans were not allowed to work in the oil industry. So these folks go and work in the white community during the week but then they come back every Friday with a good paycheck because, again, there's a ton of money in Tulsa. And they spend that money in Greenwood rather than spend it in white shops downtown where they're going to get disrespected and prevented and all this stuff. That allows the merchant class in Greenwood to flourish because they've got steady customers. And, uh, you know, was Greenwood the most successful African-American business community in 1921? No, it was not. It was not as big as, you know, Atlanta, New York, Chicago, Durham, places like that. But it's an extremely vibrant place. I, I'm sure there was a higher 
you know, per capita ratio of, of successful African American businesses to population than in most cities in the United States. Okay, so you know that that is what's going on now. As to figures, there were no millionaires uh, in 1920s terms in in Greenwood in 1921. Uh, you know, and, and the wealth in the white community dwarfed the wealth in Greenwood, okay? Go to Philbrook Art Museum sometime and look at the size of these oil men's mansions. All right, that being said though, and, and the vast majority of uh, residents of Greenwood lived in uh, small wooden homes, uh, you know, without electricity or plumbing, but the most well-to-do merchants lived in very nice homes, two-story wooden homes with pianos and fine furniture and libraries and chandeliers and all of that. We want to focus on them and we forget the regular folks that lost all their stuff as well. Now, in there's been a lot of studies recently, how much wealth was lost? How do you figure that wealth out in today's dollars? So, um, you know, there's been work done at Harvard. There's been work done by Human Rights Watch. I can tell you next month, in the June, I believe it's the June issue of uh, National Geographic, they're, they're gonna run a graph, a, a graph where what they did is they figured out the amount of wealth, uh, property wealth and whatnot, and uh, that was destroyed, owned by African-Americans in Greenwood prior to the massacre. They then imagined if that had not been destroyed and then added, you know, carried that money through the years to today, adding 4% interest, and they came up with a figure of over $600 million in today's money. So this is a very significant amount. So look, Greenwood was an astonishing, remarkable place with a very lively, vibrant business district. You had brilliant businessmen and businesswomen. You have a dozen African-American surgeons and physicians, you know, 30 restaurants, 30 grocery stores. So it's, it's very, very big and it's, it's important and it's, it's the American dream, absolutely. Um, but most people were not wealthy. And then could you just talk briefly, say a little bit more about the lost editorial? All right, so the, the editorial, uh, W.D. Williams read the editorial in the Bulldog or first edition of the Tulsa Tribune, okay. Um, when those issues were bound in the Tribune offices. They would bind in these big binders, these leather binders, all the old issues of the Tribune. In the 1930s, those were microfilmed by the WPA. But when that issue was microfilmed with all the other, you know, 1921 and, you know, whatever issues of the Tribune, somebody had cut out the front page article, which said, nab Negro for attacking girl in elevator. And they'd also torn off a third of the editorial page. Okay. So we have been able, the Nab Negro story later ran in the state edition of the Tulsa Tribune for 1920, for May 31st, 1921. That's been preserved. And Lauren Gill actually had the language in the 1940s. But the state edition of the Tribune, which was a smaller edition, it didn't run all the editorials. Um, we know the editorial existed because. Both black and white sources talk about the Tribune's May 31st, 1921 coverage. And they talk about how the Tribune mentioned a lynch mob was forming, that people were getting ready to lynch Dick Rowland. Lynch, lynch, lynching. You don't see the word lynching at all in the NAB Negro article. So there are white and black sources. Look, it hasn't shown up, but it kind of makes sense it doesn't show up. Look, some of y'all may have a old newspapers in your home, you know, uh, Japanese attack Pearl Harbor or JFK shot in Dallas or 9-11 bombing. Those are always the day after the event. That's when the big headlines are. So if you're gonna save a headline from the Tulsa Tribune or Tulsa World, it'd be 100 killed in massacre or martial law declared. It's not gonna be this May 31st issue. I'm not surprised we don't have it. Uh, but I'm 100% convinced that it existed. Thank you, Scott. Um, one of the questions that, um, or one of the things that I would love for you to talk about is just your, your work um, with the city on the multiple committees. There's a, a, a physical investigation committee and a public oversight committee. I think you work 
most closely with the physical investigation around mass graves. Can you just sort of help our audience who may or may not have been following along with this story? Um, what What's the history background to this, but also what are the efforts right now to sort of get to the bottom of you know the, whether or not there were mass graves, et cetera? Sure, so I'll try to be very brief. So um, in 1998, when I was hired as the uh, lead scholar for the Tulsa Race Ride Commission, the state commission, um, I thought, what can I do to help add some new information to this? I didn't think we were going to find a lot of the missing records, all of that. Um, I thought, you know, here we have a state commission. Maybe we can find out, number one, how many people died. But most importantly, maybe we can figure out, uh, you know, where these alleged unmarked mass graves were. So I first went to the survivor community, to survivors, some of whom I'd known for 20 years uh, or longer and uh, or shorter. And I said, look, would you like me to do this? And to a woman and a man, they said, yes, please start this search. I then went to Representative Ross. He said, fine. I went to the commission. They said, fine, whatever. They weren't all that interested. And then uh, we had a very intense, uh, I got a lot of help from some renowned experts, Dr. Clyde Snow, renowned forensic anthropologist who expanded it. He said, Scott, once we find these graves, we're gonna exhume these remains and see if we can identify these people through DNA and other techniques. Um, we, uh, an associate, Dick Warner of the Tulsa Historical Society and I, we interviewed 300 people over the course of two years, including survivors, uh, eyewitnesses, cemetery workers, funeral home directors, city employees, whatnot. We ended up identifying three potential grave sites. Uh, the state archeologist came in, we, uh, we, we used a fairly new technology of ground penetrating radar, which indicated the possibilities of mass graves. Uh, the story then broke nationally that we were searching for mass graves and uh, we got caught up in the politics of reparations. Um, despite the fact that the scholars were 99%, including me in favor of reparations, there were members of the commission that somehow felt that the emphasis on the mass grave was taken away from their effort for, for reparations. There were other members of the commission who wanted the story of the mass, they were upset that the story of the massacre had grown so big nationally, they wanted to shut down. So the, first, the, the, the Tulsa Race Riot Commission shut down our search. And then the city of Tulsa then followed on and added shutting down. And I was you know, quite depressed about that. Uh, I figured, but you know, someday, maybe not in my lifetime, somebody would want to know. So I took what records I had and boxed them away. Um, in the meanwhile, two things happened. Uh, Don Ross's son, Kevin Ross, uh, uh, as a, a young man, kept bringing up the story of the mass graves, trying to get attention to it. And he really kept the story alive. The second thing was that there was a city councilor by the name of G.T. Bynum, who had thought that it was important too. And as a city councilor, he tried to get the city of Tulsa to reopen the search for the mass graves. He was shut down by the mayor. Uh, Bynum is then elected as uh, mayor of Tulsa, I think in 2018. He decides to reopen uh, the, uh, the search. He'd contacted Kerry Stackelbeck, the uh, state archeologist. I met with him in early 2019. Um, uh, the mayor asked me to chair the physical investigation committee, which I do. And, uh, you know, working with this great team of scientists and uh, forensic scientists, archaeologists, we restarted up our search. We added a fourth site as well, too. Um, so in July, this past July, we did our first excavation at New Block Cemetery at a site we were convinced held a mass grave. It did not. But in October, we did a second excavation and we discovered a mass grave. Uh, we believe, but we have yet to prove uh, we found at least a dozen plain pine wood coffins. Uh, it's my belief that these are, they hold the remains of 18 identified and unidentified African-American uh, riot victims that 20 years earlier, we found uh, funeral home records that, that proved that white funeral homes had buried them in somewhere in Oakland Cemetery. Uh, we think we found those, but we don't know how many there actually are. So the, the remains are in very delicate condition. 
So on uh, June 1st, hopefully, we will begin the exhumation process in Oaklawn. It will take several weeks. This is, uh, we're having a, a, a renowned team of osteologists and forensic anthropologists doing this. Phoebe Stubblefield, who was part of our team 20 years ago, is now the chief forensic anthropologist on this. Uh, hopefully, we will be able to determine, you know, through wounds, through trauma, through the presence of bullets, that these are indeed massacre victims. Uh, if we extract DNA, which we hope we will, we might be able actually to determine who they are. So this will take a long time. The, the remains will then be temporarily reinterred until they can be reburied with honor and appropriately memorialized. In my mind, I see something like, you know, the tomb of the unknown soldier in Arlington Cemetery, but whatever it'll be, there'll be others who decide that. But if it's done correctly, I have no doubt that this will become a national shrine and that, that uh, people from all over the country and all over the world will want to come and see it. But we will continue our work at these other sites. Um, you know, the city is, has uh, been a solid partner in this. They've, they've spent a lot of money and, uh, uh, you know, I'm just so happy. And, you know, when, we've, when we found the mass grave in October, my first thought was to W.D. Williams and George Monroe and, uh, um, you know, some of these other Mabel Little and others, these other survivors who were so helpful keeping the story alive and how happy they would be with our discovery. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just want to touch upon something that you you mentioned. If see if I can get you to talk a little bit more about it, but um, I I had in talking with you, had, I knew about sort of JT Bynum's sort of um, initial sort of interest in the mass graves, um, but I didn't know to to the, to the degree that there was this deeper deep deep interest in terms of you know, his work as a council, uh, on the council. And so it's interesting, this back history, given that he referred to Tulsa as a, as the largest crime scene in America. And um, I'm just wondering then, what do you, what does that mean for reparations? What does that mean for justice for, you know, victim survivors and their descendants? And you, being someone who has been in conversation with survivors, um, if you can maybe talk about what did they want in terms of justice in relationship to this history? Certainly, and, and here's the commercial. So I do write about this in my new book that comes out in May, end of commercial. So, um, <laughs> you know, when, when the Riot Commission was formed 20 years ago, I wasn't so sure about reparations in all fairness. I re Look, reparations is a very complicated issue and anyone who says it isn't is fooling themselves. Um, uh, but the survivors convinced me without a question that repar monetary reparations were something that should happen. Uh, I've, I've been a, a full proponent of monetary reparations. Uh, since then, the state of Oklahoma had a great chance 20 years ago to do that. We had uh, a little over 100 living survivors who had experienced this hell. And uh, we could have done something then, but instead the state decided to give them each a gold-plated medal. Um, subsequent to that, shortly after that, Charles Ogletree of the Harvard Law School uh, helped to launch a lawsuit uh, on behalf of 100 plus survivors uh, against both the city and the state. Um, the big problem with the lawsuit was trying to get over the statute of limitations on this. And, um, you know, the hope was that uh, that that could be done by proving that African-Americans really didn't have a fair chance in court with this until our uh, 2001 Tulsa Race Riot Commission report that the scholars and I put together became available. Um, that worked its way through federal court, uh, getting a split decision and the U.S. Court of Appeals, if I understand the court's right. Uh, it went to the United States Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court would not hear the case. There was a new case that was filed either in late summer or early uh, uh, last fall by uh, uh, Demario Solomon Simmons uh, and, and a number of groups of uh, survivor, uh, a couple of survivors, uh, descendants groups uh, against the city, against the Tulsa Chamber of Commerce, a number of entities. Uh, its attempt to 
get through this statute of limitations issue is that there is something in Oklahoma called a nuisance law. And as long as a, a nuisance was created, as long as the nuisance still exists, parties responsible for the nuisance are liable. This is how the state won that big settlement against Johnson & Johnson for the opioid crisis. So that's being applied to this case. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what chances this case have, but I, I, look, this is a, the massacre was the single worst incident of racial violence in American history, defined start to beginning continuous incident, okay? Um, there's no question that uh, this has had a, a terrific in effect in lost generational wealth, trauma, and whatnot for the families who have survived this. The, you know, the trauma of the riot, the economic impacts of the massacre are not gone by any means, but it's a moral issue. It's a moral issue that, you know, none of us are, look, nobody here, not you, Carlos, not me, not any of our listeners, none of us can live our parents' or our grandparents' lives. You know, we're not responsible for what they did. We're only responsible for what we do. But our institutions, the city, the state, the federal government who did nothing in response to this, they still exist. And I think that there is a moral imperative to pay some form of restitution. So that's something I'm certainly in favor of. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, we are getting close to time, but there were a couple questions that, you know, really are wanting to understand sort of who gets to tell this story, who even owns this story, whose voices related to this should we really be paying attention to, listening to? And so I know that's a, a complicated question and I can imagine your response to that, um, that question, but can you just help us to understand why the 100th anniversary of the race massacre is so important, given all the work that you've done over the last 40 years? Well, let, let, let's go ahead and dig with that first part. And, uh, and, and you know, the, the subcontext of that me might be, why does a person who looks a certain way, is, are they allowed to tell somebody else's story? I would answer it this way. Um, believe it or not, the Tulsa Race Massacre is not a black history event. It is a black and white history event. There were arguably as many white people involved in the massacre as there were African-Americans. I am a, an American historian. I'm a writer. I write about American history. Um, if you're gonna write about American history, you're going to have to write about people who don't look like you, uh, you know, who live different lives or you know, are of different genders, uh, different ethnicities. That's just the truth of the matter. This is something that novelists playwrights do all of the time. And um, so this is an American, this is a Tulsa story. It's an Oklahoma story, but this is an American story. Look, the thing, one thing that get, there's a few things that get forgotten. One is with all the emphasis of Black Wall Street, everyone forgets these courageous 75 African-American World War I vets who go and risk their lives and in some cases lose their lives to protect a young man that probably none of them knew uh, from getting murdered by a lynch mob. Um, those are American heroes. Those are American heroes that are, to me, as important as the farmers who stood, you know, like a stone wall at Lexington and Concord. They're not trying to break Dick Rowland out of jail. They're, they're just trying to make sure he gets a trial, even a rigged Jim Crow trial. These are American heroes. They need to be celebrated. But, you know, the larger point is this is, you know, the other thing that gets forgotten, too, is in Oklahoma, when lynch mobs gathered, white lynch mobs gathered, black Oklahomans gathered with guns and they were going to prevent these lynchings. And, you know, the number of lynchings is pretty steady. You get after the Tulsa race riots, not to say they went away, but the numbers start to really decline. And I think that uh, African-Americans in Tulsa sent word out to white America that we're not we're not going to tolerate these anymore. And they paid an incredible price. Look, this is a story of human resilience. Uh, you know, Greenwood was rebuilt. Uh, it flourished once again. This is a story everybody, I don't care what your background is, uh, what you look like, we can all learn from. Scott, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, I also want to thank our audience members who stayed with us and, and listened 
both to your your pre-recorded comments, Scott, as well as just the amazing responses that you had to all of our questions. So so thank you. Thank I want to thank our audience, but I also want to encourage our audience to continue uh, to to hear you know from the really great speakers and presentations we have for the remainder of the day. I believe we dropped in the chat uh, a link to uh, the rest of the sessions uh, for the symposium this afternoon. So again, thank you, Scott. Thank you, everyone, for, for being in participation, bearing witness with us. Thank you. Thank Have you. It's an honor day. to be here. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Thank you.